Good evening, everyone. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Welcome to tonight's event. Gavin and Blair, can you can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. And yes, Blair? I can hear you. Hiya. Great. Blair, you kept popping up there on the, on camera yeah, while you were my phone, kept, my phone kept falling over, so it's, it's quite hard to do here. I, I, I got the reception, but I haven't managed to balance my phone okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Really welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. We, um, well, delighted to invite you all to this, this event tonight, um, exploring the Scottish backcountry. Um, the two guests tonight have over 20 years of, um, of off-piste skiing experience, so I think we're in for a, a real treat. So um, please, please feel free to use the chat and the Q&A to ask as many questions. If you're watching on Facebook, then post your comments below and we'll, um, we'll see if we can get as many questions to them as possible. Um, I'll, be, I'll be looking at questions. So if you see me look around, that's because I'm trying to deal with all the questions as well. So, um, so the guys, um, Gavin and Blair are from British Backcountry. Um, British Backcountry offers uh, skill courses, journey and days, gully skiing, coaching, Ben Nevis trips. Um, it's a case of what don't you offer really on, on snow, isn't it really? That would be easier. Um, the guys run courses in France and Scotland, but um, I think not it's... Not France, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore in France, okay. Um, so in Scotland, well, that's good because I was going to say Scotland is where your home, where your home is and where your hearts are really. And, and tonight's talk is all about exploring Scotland. So um, definitely more great. convenient. Yes. So, so over the next 40 minutes, we want to explore what makes Scotland so special and why backcountry skiing is becoming so popular, as well as um, get the guys' takes on, on what's needed, how you get into it and lots more. So there's going to be a variety of people watching this evening. Um, we appreciate that and hopefully we can cover off lots of stuff for everyone. So um, so great. Guys, what, why don't you kick things off by um, just giving us a bit of an intro to each of you, if that's that's all right. Start with you, Gavin. That's cool. Um, yep. Yeah. So um, I learned to ski uh, when I was um, about so five, five, six years old, got taken up to Glenshee by my parents. And because uh, I live in Edinburgh, I got the local dry ski slope Hill End and went up there with my school, did some lessons, got into race training, um, did a lot of skiing from there through race training, got into freestyle, um, and I really enjoyed sort of that side of things. And, um, and then I went to university, still competed in the racing and the freestyle side of things. And then I got a bit disillusioned with skiing. I, I actually stopped for about a year or two just because I wasn't so interested. And then um, one of my friends took me ski touring at Cairngorm, the, sort of the slope I went to, a lot of the time in Scotland and we must have traveled less than a minute outside the ski area and I was just blown away by how the mountain looked and, and I knew I knew straight away I was like this this is for me and, uh, and that's been almost 10 years ago uh, from sort of being first taken out for a ski tour and to be honest I've never looked back it's, it's, it's really sort of inspired me from the skiing and um, got away and done a season after then and um, so now now sort of skiing and, and working with Blair doing all the ski touring so then um, so yes, I've had, uh, done quite a lot of different types of skiing and uh, certainly ski too recently has been the thing that's uh, inspired me. Great, thanks Gavin. And you Blair? Yeah. Well, for, uh, Gav, Gav and I's background is pretty similar um, because we, we started racing at the dry ski slope and um, I had a caravan up at Glenmore campsite. So I spent weekends up in Cairngorm. Um, but I guess, uh, well, Gav was um, working as a maths teacher. I, I spent uh, 10 years out in uh, Val d'Isere running a ski school, for New Generation Ski School. Um, I think Els Brighamer linked up with them as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'd already done a bit of ski touring in Scotland uh, early in my early 20s, uh, just in Cairngorm and actually Pentland Hills as well. Um, but it wasn't something I was doing a lot of until I went through the ski instructor, uh, the Basie Awards. Um, and obviously it's part of the, the Basie Award to get to... The, the level you need to be for France. Um, so I got a lot of knowledge from that. And then because of the place I was working, Espas Keeley's got some amazing access points uh, for ski touring. And it's most most of the big tours there are non-glaciated. So working as a ski instructor, that's perfect. You know, you can you can run ski touring courses with clients. Um, and I got into sort of steeper skiing and more adventurous skiing. Um, started climbing and skiing some of the bigger mountains in the area. Um, and then uh, sort of personal circumstance changed. Uh, it was time to move back to Scotland with the family. And I just, I wanted to find a way of keeping it going. 
in Scotland. Um, and at the time, yeah, like I said, at the time I was more interested in steeper, more challenging terrain. Um, so I started up the British Backcountry Group and, and just tried to find other people that wanted to do similar things through social media. Um, initially, I was going out on my own a lot. Uh, and then, yeah, started to find lots of people that liked to ski weird, obscure gullies in the Highlands. Um, and I think recruited Gav fairly early on as well. Um, and then, yeah, it's kind of, I was just impressed by just how much was out there, but also uh, how how much my skill set was lacking because I'd obviously done, you know, I'd done a few, a few big peaks, but a lot of it was was ski touring and in good snow. Whereas in Scotland, you need more of a holistic mountaineering skill set. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of move more into ski mountaineering as, as well as ski touring. Um, so, yeah, that kind of brings me up to where I am now. And the, and the courses were uh, out of request from the British Backcountry Group. People were saying, well, you know, you've been doing this sort of thing in the Alps. Could you take me out in Scotland? Um, so it kind of grew from there. And Gab was working for Glenmore Lodge, you know, and uh, we, we knew each other from before. So it kind of made sense to link up. Excellent. So my kind of my first question really was um, for anyone who is looking at sort of backcountry skiing and thinking of getting into it. Sounds like you've just really answered that in terms of join join your Facebook group and um, team up with like minded people, really. But is that that's kind of how most people and you see sort of has done it? It's just kind of come through friends who and then for you guys. Is that the key? Yeah, I, I, well, I think um, I think certainly if you if you if you haven't really got a, an easy way in, like there's not a group of friends that you know already doing it, um, then you're going to have to look at clubs. You're going to have to look at courses. I mean, you really need to look at your starting point and think, well, where am I coming from? Uh, we, we certainly um, are very good at upscaling alpine skiers, you know, looking at the, the, the areas where alpine skier needs to, um, you know, sort of navigation, mountaineering skills, um, sort of things you wouldn't get just being a, being a peace skier. Um, uh, but then you've also got people coming from a hill walking background who, who are, are looking at this terrific way to move about in the mountains um, and then have to actually find a way of um, getting the skills of skiing back down, which is the harder way of doing it. But, but there's plenty of opportunity in the UK to learn those skills. Brilliant. So um, can you maybe sum up why everyone should try backcountry skiing, maybe in three words, four words? <laughs> Put you on the spot a little bit there. Or go. Or Gavin the can do that one. Gavin can answer that one. <laughs> Brave new world. What was that, Gavin? Sorry. Brave, Brave new world. <laughs> Brilliant. Love it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, um, and um, so, just in terms of you talked there about giving people the skills to sort of go from from piece to off piece. Um, can you talk about about? The kind of skills that are needed to sort of transition from piece skiing to off piste. What do you think, Gav? Yeah, so certainly, uh, like coming from an, a sort of alpine, a skiing background, um, you're very used to just being in the resorts, guided about uh, the hill, and you may even just be following the piece markers. If you've got a good awareness of using a piece map and stuff, that, that's that's a that's a good starting point anyway. And if you've uh, grown up through school doing sort of Duke of Edinburgh thing. Then uh, you may be familiar using sort of OS maps and things, uh, but but certainly coming from the peace background, uh, just things like making sure you look at the weather, uh, having some hill fitness that's from sort of doing hill walking, and then looking about how you can take that into a winter environment with navigation and uh, looking at avalanche awareness as well. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, and then. Sort of as part of that, really, one of the questions, because we asked for questions before this evening as well, and pe some people sent some in. Um, also, you know, feel free to send in your questions right now. But um, one question was, how how concerned do you get about people going off piece who are maybe not not that experienced, who don't have the skills? Is it is it a bit of, not necessarily part of your groups, but kind of generally, is it something you, from your Glenmore Lodge days, and is it something that you you really strive to kind of, you know, want to correct with people get them trained and then they can go off wherever they want yeah I, I think i think in in scotland um i mean i don't say it doesn't concern me but it doesn't concern me nearly as much as it did in the alps um and uh, you know the the sort of skiing that happens in in, in the alps ten, like there's a lot of people doing ski touring from from the road and from um remote places as well um however majority of it is coming from a lift system and, and the problem with a lift system is you can hop off lift system get off piece very very quickly and easily and get yourself into some pretty serious terrain without too much time to consider what's up ahead. 
Um, whereas the sort of skiing that's happening in Scotland, and you, you do get that stuff as well. You know, you can access the off-piece from the lift system. Of course you can. But um, a lot of ski touring, the majority of ski touring in Scotland will be starting from a car park or a road. And you're approaching a mountain very slowly. You're quite possibly approaching the slope you're going to ski very slowly. There's a lot of time to think and consider and prepare. And in fact, you're you're very unlikely just to head out into the hills in Scotland without having done a lot of preparation beforehand. Um, Scottish Avalanche Information Service say that 80% of the planning and preparation should be happening before you even get to the to the to the place you're going. Um, and I actually think that we've got quite a good culture in Scotland, probably because of the amount of people who hill walk and take part in activities on the mountain and um, people have, do have the knowledge um, that are coming into ski touring um, whereas a lot of people do in the Alps as well but there are also a large number of people who are just coming from peace skiing and they're seeing this amazing stuff off the side it, it's very tempting uh, just to traverse across and ski something that is over 30 degrees and could be avalanche prone um, or perhaps they don't quite read the weather that's coming in that day and they go somewhere off the back of something and then the weather closes in and they can't find a way out. Um, all of these things happen in Scotland, but I do think in general, people are more, more um, prepared for that sort of eventuality. Great, thanks, Matt. And so the, the sort of top tips for anyone thinking of heading to Scotland is sort of get, get acquainted with your environment before you go and um, understand bit more about the terrain things like that is that would you say maybe go on a course things like that oh well, absolutely yeah yeah yeah, I, I'm, yeah so well gav yeah i mean you've what do you think you've got the reason we've set up a lot of those skills courses is just for that reason it's because we sort of looked at where people are, are are asking for more input and we're trying to fill fill the fill the holes i guess yeah yeah certainly uh, for alpine skiers Going into ski touring is pretty daunting, so um, I think the biggest thing you can offer when they come on a course with us is one, they can they can just borrow a bit of the kit to get in ski touring, but the main thing is confidence, so that they can go out and know that they're going to have a sort of secure day and take some enjoyment away from it, and then they can look to go right. I had, I really enjoyed that. I'm going to go buy myself a ski touring setup and um, avalanche kit and everything, and, and then really really throw themselves into it. Thanks, guys. Um, so. Kind of want to move on to um the sort of um where you can go skiing so we've kind of discussed maybe the how and the why but um where you can go skiing in scotland and um maybe give us a bit of an insight into um some of the areas that you can gav i know you've just you've written an article recently for one of our magazines um exploring the backcountry so maybe you could kind of give people a few pointers on some of the areas to head to if they're yeah. up to Scotland this winter. So yeah, the article I wrote for the, the magazine was sort of six of my sort of, uh, favourite uh, descents in Scotland. And, and it wasn't geared at people sort of being introduction or experienced. It was just a whole mix of everything. Um, so places that are good in Scotland on, on the whole, we're in, talking in the Highlands uh, and we're really looking at places that you can access easy from the road. So there's quite a lot of hills uh, round about Dromocter which is sort of about an hour south of Aviemore, or two hours north of the kind of Edinburgh, Glasgow area. And uh, there's a range of, sort of rolling hills there that you can access quite easily. Um, and then we're looking round about the Cairngorm Mountains themselves, whether you're accessing from the Aviemore side, from Cairngorm ski area, or over in the Glen Cheese, Braemar area. And then travelling through to west, um, You've, you've obviously got the ski resorts round about uh, the Nevis range. Uh, so you're looking at things like Anik Moor, Anik Beg, Ben Nevis, but pretty steep terrain around there. Same with around about the Glencoe area. And then in between the two, you're looking at sort of Craig Meggy mountains or the, the Monolith. And if you really want to kind of push yourself, I suppose you'd be looking sort of further north, maybe uh, Ben Wivis up by Inverness is one of the sort of local hills around there. And then if you can find the snow and make it work, if you can maybe get some skiing on Sky or Torridon, then um, <laughs> that's the dream ticket. I was over in Sky from a honeymoon and there was snow down to the sea level uh, when I was away there in February. And we went hill walking, but I really wanted to have my skis with me for a descent when I was there. Um, yeah, that would have been amazing. You missed, you missed the Cairn Garms, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Cairn Garms, yeah, yeah, I said, yeah. Oh, did you? Sorry, I'm, I think, I think um, like it depends on time of year as well, doesn't it? Like you know, there's no real to it, but in general, we tend to start in the Cairngorms and Dromochter. Um, part, partly because the, the snow collects. Well, yeah, we've got high high starting points, but the snow the snow gets. Um, you know, the the wind is constantly moving the snow, and it, it tends to start to collect and 
um, you know, for normal season, you could have a lot of southwesterly wind. So the east side of Cairngorm, for example, will get a lot of snow. Um, plus, you've got the snow fences of the ski centre, which you can follow up, if, you know, as long as you are careful with that and you're not, not in the way of anybody else. But you could, you know, that the snow collects there. So that's your access point, And then you can descend off the back of Cairngorm. Um, so and also those hills, um, you know, there's a lot of rock there, but it's not to the same degree as in the west. So you're, you're skiing over areas where there's like heather under the ground and softer ground in it. It certainly takes a little bit less snow to, to collect. Um, but I think uh, another area, did you mention Ben Lors? No, I, would, I just realised I missed out the Ben Lawyer's area as well. So, so yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's, again, not there's not an exact science to this, but for me, I, I expect to be starting in Cairngorm, Dromochter, and then I would hope to be sort of February, March, moving into like Ben Lawyer's. And then our because of the sort of products that we deliver at the end of the season, we move into the steeper skiing. So that's more in the west around Glencoe, Ben Nevis, Annick Moore. Uh, and then we go back to the Cairngorms and we do some of the gullies there as well. So, yeah, that's that's our sort of normal season. And then, you know, you've got the steep gully lines on Ben Nevis, which are actually good all the way through until July. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, hopefully. Um, so there is some some late season skiing as well. Okay. Where's where's this shot taken? Is that um, is that one of I can't, those? I can't see the slides, actually. How can you not? Oh, sorry. That's all right. Describe it to me. Has it got a lock? It's got. It's bound to have a lock. At the it looks. It looks. Yeah. It looks like it's you in a blue jacket and okay. red, red pants climbing up. So I don't have anything to remember. It. It. No. Okay. Don't worry. Oh, no, hang on. Hang on. Okay, I understand. There's a yeah. The the, the gentleman climbing up the gully. Yes. That's, um. Yeah. That's stop stop carrying and locking in Glencoe. Uh. Okay. That is terrific. Yeah. So that's if you ever drive up through Glencoe, there's the car park everyone parks at, and they get out of the car and take a picture of the three sisters, and they get back in the car and drive again. Do you know? Do you know that one? Uh, anyway, it's that one. So you look up into the behind the three sisters. There's like this, this strip of snow. It's broad gully, and it's just uh, it just invites you in from Glencoe. It's such a classic, uh, and 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 it faces uh, it must face uh, east or northeast. I think it must because it collects a lot of snow as well from the prevailing wind coming off the Atlantic. So pretty safe bet that you'll get to ski that at some point in the year. And um, pretty serious terrain though. You know, shouldn't be underestimated. Brilliant. You know, you know your stuff. That was uh, that was good considering you can't see the picture. I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hope it's the right picture otherwise that didn't make any sense at all <laughs> no it is that picture uh, so uh, just I mean, one of the one of the beauties of skiing in scotland i always think is is that you can get quite remote quite quickly um so of those areas do they t i bet you don't tend to see many other people or it depends on the year well, time of year i guess but is there many remote sort of locations that in scotland is that the beauty of scotland to go and escape from it all in those places yeah yeah i mean there's some pretty big spaces uh you know between between the roads um so uh i mean it depends your definition of remote you know you, you, it doesn't really matter you, you get the feeling of being remote you know when you're when you're somewhere and you look down below you and there's no infrastructure for me that's remote you know um yeah. but remote remote you're you're remote as soon as you go off the back of a mountain you know and, and that's the i'm noticing these wee comments popping up and uh somebody was saying something about exit exit plans you know and, and that's absolutely right as soon as you go off the back of a mountain, then you've got to really seriously think about if something goes wrong, how are you going to get yourself back down again, back up and down, you know? Whereas you're the front side of the mountain, I mean, that's quite a sensible thing to start with if you're getting into ski touring. You know, you stay, you go to Dromochter and you ski uh, Gilcarn and, you, and you're and you just, uh, you know, you're above the, you're above the, where your car's parked, you know, so you could stay just above your car park. So at the end of the day, you could walk out if there was a, an equipment problem or if, you know your navigation is going to be easier as well as long as the cloud doesn't come in but yeah that as soon as you go off the back of that same mountain down to Loch Eric you know Ben Alder in the background that that is remote because if a binding malfunctions or um, you get yourself a bit lost you can get yourself in a right pickle um, so there's a feeling of remoteness and then there's this this uh, more seriousness when you when you get somewhere that you know you really have to get out uh, yourself and um, it's very very difficult for somebody to come and help you um, great Thanks, thanks, Blair. Uh, Gav's busy working away on all the um, the answers to the questions here. That's brilliant. Thanks, thanks for your help, Gavin. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm struggling, struggling to get to them, but um, I just, um, I, in fact, we'll go we'll go to a few questions from people because um, they're sort of stacking up. And even though okay. you, um, hey, Gav's going to do all the work tonight because they're not coming on my phone. I know he's great. <laughs> well, one one question from from Inga was, uh, "What's the one piece of kit you wouldn't be without?" And, and Gavin's answered that with extra cake um, and then said, and good planning and an exit plan if things go wrong, which is great. Um, 
one of the question, one of them, this one is from, sorry, bear with me one sec. Um, this is from Alan. He says, I'm a bit of an old timer. To me, backcountry is a relatively new phrase. What is the difference between that and ski mountaineering? Uh, I thought he was going to say ski touring or off-piece skiing. Mm. Um, I'd say there is a difference between ski mountaineering, but um, actually, Gav, I'm talking too much. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I, basically the, the phrase just covers everything. I suppose if you're talking about backcountry in, in terms of how it's used now, I suppose that's kind of like a multi-sport discipline, getting out there in the kind of wilderness and but, you know, getting away from it all, I suppose, is how people use it. But in terms of like skiing backcountry and um, ski touring, ski mountaineering, um, I suppose, as Blair mentioned in France, you can go and ski off piste and off the lift system. Like you can certainly do that in Chamonix and access into the backcountry without using ski touring equipment. But uh, they're, they're certainly all related and a lot of the skill sets blend across the different areas. I would say that um, as soon as you use the word mountaineering, then you're, I, I, would, I would expect you to be using some equipment, mountaineering equipment, or ice axe and crampons. There might be the, the need for, uh, to use a rope, uh, that sort of thing. Um, there'd be a little bit of kind of climbing or scrambling. Um, whereas uh, a ski touring would, to me, would be keeping the skis on the feet for most, almost all of the, the day. Um, I mean, back, back, back country is an American term. You know, um, I prefer it to off-piste. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's much the same as what we've been talking about before. It's just a kind of rebranding of something that was already out there um, to make it a bit more understandable. And of course, you've got the other term, side country, uh, which would be um, your, get your access in terrain just off the lift system. But it, you know, it's semantics. It's not so important. But I guess it can be confusing because there are some terms floating around. And, I, and the good thing about backcountry is it's more... Um, it covers snowboarding as well, splitboarding, you know, whereas it's very easy to talk about ski touring all the time. And that um, disenfranchises a lot of people who go out and slip, split boards, yeah, and snowblades and monoboards and uh, telemark skis. Great. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. That's really helpful, I think, clearing that up. Um, so, John, John asked, for someone that likes to tour alone, what advice would you give, apart from the obvious, like telling someone where you're going? Um, what key bits of kit should you take that people never think of? Gav, what have we just bought? Uh, well, we've just bought, a, uh, just started a couple of the Garmin inReach devices. Um, they allow you to track people when they, they, they're off uh, in areas where there's no phone coverage. So uh, because, because of our uh, day jobs, uh, we'll be sometimes one of us will be working in the mountains and one of us will be back in the sort of central belt area. So having one of the, these devices allow us to track what's going on and they'll allow you some sort of basic satellite communication with each other. And also you can press a button and it'll take an alert straight to the mountain rescue surface. Brilliant little device. We're not planning on using it, but it's just another thing that gives you another chance of something that go wrong. What about um, things like um, avalanche packs and things like that? Do you you always carry those with you? And um, obviously, tran transceivers is a is a yeah. is a must. But um, but avalanche packs. Or I think I think I think with all this equipment, you know, you you, you need to. It comes back to the planning stage of the day. You need to think about what equipment do you need for the environment you're going into. Um, and there might be a day in Scotland where, or there might, be, there might be lots of days in Scotland where you decide that an avalanche pack is necessary. Um, it depends on the terrain you're planning on skiing. I, I don't use one because I don't, well, I, there is, I did, I did use one in the past um, and certainly used one in Val de I was skiing um, some very big, big open slopes um, and I was skiing them at what I deemed to be a safe time. Um, however, uh, I was I was working in that environment a lot, um, so it made sense to have one. The sort of terrain I'm working in now, there's there's this is a generalisation, but there's not always a, a great deal of snow depth. Um, it's it's not impossible that there could be an avalanche. Um, what I'd be more worried about in an avalanche in Scotland is trauma, um, because the, the, the snow can still move, but it's not not as deep as in the Alps. You know, I'm going to get dragged over rocks and all sorts of horrible things. So an airbag's not really going to be the solution in that situation. Um, we certainly always carry um, a transceiver, a shovel and probe. Um, and I mean, there's also, there we could list all the equipment we have in our bags. But for me, the, the, the number one thing is the, my map and compass. Um, what else, Gav? What do you think would you put in as your safety equipment as a must? Uh, mobile phone. Yep. Um, Otherwise, 
Nobody on Facebook knows what you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, a, head, a head torch if you're going at early season, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, it's so easy to just, you know, the sun's coming down at, what, four o'clock, even earlier sometimes. Yeah. Right. I've, I've waited for Gavin, Kieran Gorm, Car Park a few times. Excellent. Uh, there was just one question, I think, Gavin, you responded to, but what was the name of the, the device? It was the Gar Garmin Reach, is that right? In Reach. Yeah, the Garmin Reach. Reach. I think yeah. my Scottish accent is uh, not, not coming across very clearly. <laughs> Garmin In Reach is the, there's, the there, one. There's other brands as well. It's not the only one. It's just the one we've decided to use this season. Right. There's devices like the Spot device and stuff as well that you can have a look at. We've kind of, we kind of jumped ahead to um, gear, but that, that's fine. I mean, I had a few other questions just about... Um, sort of Scotland particularly, um, and a few people asking what's the most um, satisfying route, or sorry, what's the what's the most um, route that you regularly go to? So you sort of wake up in the morning, you think you've got a group of guys and girls that you're taking out, where would you sort of default go? Is there a place that you, you sort of rely on for to deliver the goods? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, so again, it depends on the, sea, uh, the, the time of the season. If it's early season um, in Scotland, we need to get high. And the most likely place normally uh, at the start of the year that's going to be favourable will be the Cairngorm Mountains for us. Um, and just so we can get up to like about a thousand odd metres uh, to make sure that we get the snow. Um, as the season develops uh, and the, the snow comes down to a lower level, we'd be looking at the hills round about Tremoctor. From there, uh, Gail Carn is one that we that we enjoy working on with people that are new to ski touring. If, if um, because majority of our clients are coming from the central belt, um, uh, I would if I can, I'll always use Ben Lors. Um, I just think that the terrain around there is amazing. Um, you've got absolutely every different aspect. You know, it doesn't matter where the snow's been coming in from. You'll find somewhere there with, with good snow. Um, you know, you've got different gradients as well. It's it's not. Um, I mean, there are some steeper lines in Meal and Tarmacan, and I guess you, there is some steeper lines on Ben Lors itself, but you wouldn't, they're not the sort of thing people would do. Um, but you've, you've got steeper lines, you've got mellow lines, you've got everything in between. So it's just such a good area. But the, the big downside of Ben Lors is it is a high road. Um, it's got an access point. Um, sorry, it's got a road that goes up to a reservoir. So it's the it's the, the maintenance road for people going up and for the for them going up to, to yeah maintain the reservoir in the winter. So it is cleared, but it's not it's not always cleared first thing in the morning. So you need to know exactly what the conditions are like on the road before you attempt that one, um, because obviously you're going there when there's low snow, and low snow means the road might be white. Um, so people get themselves in the right pickle on that road. But uh, yeah, but if, if, you know, so the perfect day for me is Ben Lars Road is perfect. You know, you can get all the way up to the reservoir, uh, but there's snow right to the car park level, which must be, what is it, 600 metres or something, the car park? It must be about that. I can't yeah. remember. I've got my car stuck on at least one occasion there. <laughs> Yeah, but then from there you've got you've got you could you could go to Milan Tarmac and you could go to Mill Corny, you've got Ben Glass, Ben Lores behind. It's just so much stuff there. Um so that's I really enjoy working there. Um but then yeah, like I've said, you know, that's not always in condition. So Karen Gorman's and Rockter are a pretty safe bet. Uh but for for me, like um some of the most exciting skiing I've done has been on Ben Nevis. I just Ben Nevis is just incredible. And it's comparable to some of the gully skiing, some of the cool war skiing you go get in the Alps. Yeah, but on the north face, uh, the side that a lot of people don't see because they got the, the, the summer walking path. Um, yeah, so, so on the north face, you've got all these gullies, you know, um, crown of east, you've just got gullies all around you. Um, and then you've got the classic tower gully and observatory gully, which goes all the way down to the valley floor. And then in the valley floor itself, you've got the CIC hut, which unfortunately is closed at the moment, but it's just an incredible place to spend a couple of days. Um, again, that feeling of remoteness, but with all the facilities there. And just this amphitheater of skiing above you, um, so that I mean that's quite that's quite special to spend time there. Yeah, sounds sounds amazing. And mm. is, is there many places in Scotland that you haven't skied? I mean, if, what what's on your sort of bucket list still to still to do, if there is anywhere? Oh, there's tons, absolutely tons. I mean, uh, you know, the, our our friends who we ski with uh, have done far more than us. Um, you know, they they don't do it as a uh, as a job like we do. Um, and, 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 that, and that's probably why they've done more than us, you know, uh, because we're obviously taking people to, the, to those snowshore places where we know folk are going to have a good day. Um, I would love to go and run courses up in the northwest, um, some of the places that Gav spoke about. 
Um, but that's a long way from Edinburgh and you've got to drive past all the low hanging fruit. You know, you've got to drive past the Cairngorms, you've got to drive through Glencoe or depending on which side you go up from past Ben Lawrence, all these amazing places you'd have to go past and drive another few hours, maybe even three, four hours more to get to these other locations, which, um, you know, I, I have, I've kind of left them intentionally as well. Like I want there to be some mystery to skiing in Scotland, you know, so I'm not rushing to go and get all these lines that I've, that I've seen my friends ski. Because for me, once I've done those, I'd be like, mm, you know, what, what's next? Uh, so at the moment, I've yeah, still got that to look forward to. Good. I'm going to ask Gavin, but he's just he's just eating a biscuit, I think. But can you? I, I am <laughs> I'm on the mince pies. <laughs> <laughs> Same question to you, Gavin. What, what um, have you got any places on your bucket list left to ski? Yeah, well? like for sure, I want to go go up skiing in Torridon. It's uh, yeah. that's the the dream. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Nice. Anchelic as well. The galleys on Anchelic, that would be something special. Fantastic. Um, what's, your, what's been your best and worst experiences on a set of skis up in Scotland? Have you got any? I mean, the weather's uh, always a bit. I've got, a, I've got a funny story. Uh, so uh, it was my first day working at Glenmore Lodge. Uh, I was out with Andy T. Um, uh, with a group and we were taking them out ski touring and um, just on the sort of Cairngorm up uh, something called Lurcher's Gully relatively uh, mellow ascent and descent and on the approach up we're, we're, we tend to follow a streamline on, on the way up because uh, that's where it collects the snow and as I was heading up chatting with Andy just uh, I briefed the group about making sure that they didn't fall into the stream and just keep slightly to the side and just after I said this I broke through the snow myself and both feet straight into the <laughs> into the river uh, but managed to put my elbows out and roll myself back onto the snow but um, Andy now tells that to most of the new instructors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine that's quite an easy one to do though isn't it? <laughs> Get stuck in a stream. Um, what about you Blair? You got any we start with a bad day as well. <laughs> uh, like, again, thinking about Cairngorm, um, you know, you can, it's quite easy to get, uh, to be a bit over optimistic with the weather there. And I've had a few where I've gone up there when it's been a southeasterly wind. And the thing with a southeasterly wind and a southerly wind as well sometimes does this is it can accelerate over the plateau um, and it can be a lot stronger than you think it's going to be. So I've been out with a group before and it's just, you know, I've misjudged it. Uh, it's been felt like about 20 miles an hour more than it should have. Um, because it, it, it has to sort of, it just gets squashed, it comes over and accelerates down into the quarry and you just get blasted with it. Um, and, you know, 20 miles an hour can, is a huge difference, uh, you know, when you're out just in ski touring equipment. So I've had to sort of retreat back to the cafe and say, look, guys, we're just having to do this another day. Um, so nothing as dramatic as falling into a river. But um, those, those are the days you learn from, you know, it, it, you've been, because you spend a lot of time beforehand looking at these forecasts and thinking, you know, is this acceptable? Is this the, you know, am I going out in the right wind speed? Uh, and then, yeah, those southeasterly winds can, can really catch you out. Uh, so I have to remind myself every single winter about that and just say, look, you know, you have to draw the line a little bit lower. You know, it looks like a good number, but it's not a good number because of the direction it's coming in from. Um, but the best, are you, have you still got the slides up there, actually? Yeah, I've got the... Yeah. The one of the guy in green skiing down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's my, that would be the best day. I'm, I'm repeating myself again, but this is Ben Lawrence once again. Um, so this was a day which um, I, I've talked about this quite a bit in the past, but but basically it was one of these days where uh, it's the perfect storm in that, well, it's not a storm, it's not a storm. It's the perfect forecast. It's blue skies, there's snow in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, so everybody's thinking, what do I do in this situation? Okay, I go skiing. Well, I run the skis. So you know, the roads to the ski centre are just rammed full of cars, you know, nobody can get anywhere. Um, but Ben Lawrence is before all the traffic, you know, so I'd arranged to meet my, my clients there. I'd, I'd gone up the night before, actually, um, to check the road. It was snowing pretty heavily uh, and the road was blocked. No way I could get up there. But the snow was so low that I thought, well, why did it just start at the loch level? Um, so I, I went to a car park near Laura's village uh, where the Ben Lawrence Hotel is a bit further along. And I just parked there and I said, meet me here. And we started ski touring um, on the farm tracks, you know, right next to Loch Tay. Um, and we skinned up from the very bottom up to the top of uh, Ben Glass. Um, it's got to be not far off a thousand vertical meters from Loch level up to the summit. Um, 
skied in powder, which is that picture. You know, that's a, it looks like it should be the Alps, but that is a Scottish picture, believe it or not. Um, and I know there'll be people saying, oh, but that's only about, that's only about boot deep. <laughs> well, boot deep's pretty good for Scotland. I'll take boot deep. Um, <laughs> so we had boot deep snow uh, all the way down Ben Glass and we climbed up Ben Lors all the way down and we just kept going. You know, I physically couldn't ski anymore when I got to the bottom. It was, it was just so tiring, you know, because it was like turn after turn after turn, but it was just incredible snow. So once I worked, I was with Arbroath Ski Club, actually. I was guiding our Arbroath Ski Club. So once we got them down, off they went. They were absolutely buzzing. First day ski touring and they just had this perfect day. Um, I called my friend and I said, look, you know, you got to come here. If you're going to go anywhere today, just come here. So he drove up and met me at four o'clock and we did the whole thing again at night with head torches. Um, and I just have this memory of skiing Ben Lors and all I saw was just the sort of the head torch going out in front and just these plumes of spray coming up, you know. And because it was it was quite a dark night, you couldn't really see where this was ending. And it just felt like the never ending run all the way back down to the car. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it does. It, it's surreal when that happens because you just you sort of think, well, you know, this is what I want. This is what I've planned for and everything. But then you don't expect it to, to come as good as that in Scotland. You kind of expect a bit of pain and suffering sometimes with the weather. Um, but, yeah, when you luck out like that, it's just it's, it's so good. Yeah, <clears throat> that sounds amazing. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I'm going to go through to a few questions now. Um, uh, where to start? So um, let's take this one from John. John, um, hi, I'm, I'm now coming up to 80. I've tried to get on courses in France and Italy, accepted on the course, but uh, told the course is full. Can I skip, still get to do it? Um, I wonder if he's talking, I'm not sure what, which one he's talking about, which course. Hey, yeah, we, I'm not running, running in, in, in France. France. It's what, sorry? We're not running any courses in France or Italy, so I'm not sure what. No, okay. We'll, we'll if John wants if to give us a bit more. Of, if it's a question about age, I mean, that, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know. The, the, th the thing with Scotland that you'd, um, Gav was talking about the physical side of it. Um, I would say if you're, if you can climb a Monroe in the summer, you know, and that's well within your ability. So uh, it depends on the Monroe, of course, because some Monroes start lower than others. But if, say, you can do a thousand vertical meters of hill walking in the summer and, and, and that's within your ability, carrying a pack, um, then, yeah, a, a ski touring day, an introductory ski touring day would be, would be something physically you could do. Uh, the, the, one, the other thing that gets people is the changeable conditions. Um, and that's not just Scotland, you know, like the Alps. Um, when you go skiing in the Alps, you don't always get perfect snow. You know, you've got probably more chance of it, but, um, you know, in Scotland, you're going to be skiing every single different snow type in a day. Uh, so the ability to be able to ski ice and then soft windblown snow and then maybe some sticky snow and to be able to adjust, that's the thing that, 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 that folk need to, need to get, a, get a hang of, really. But um, all these things are, uh, you know, depending on people's starting point, if they're a good red run skier, uh, we, can, we can usually get people through all that terrain um, and show them how to do it safely in an introductory course. Great. Uh, Andrew asked, two of us are in Glencoe for the last two weeks in March. Would you suggest any reasonably straightforward options that we can investigate? We're fully kitted with about two weeks touring experience. So obviously basing themselves in Glencoe, where would you suggest they could head to if they don't want to just stick in? Get, give our friend Rob Kingsland a shout. <laughs> um, Glen, the thing we, over in the West Coast is a lot of the terrain is really steep and uh, there are quite a few terrain traps over there. Uh, so in terms of going ski touring, it's possible, but, but it can certainly be pretty treacherous over there. Um, the Nevis Range ski area should be opening uh, around about March time. And from there, you can, if, if it's up and running, you can jump out uh, and sort of ski over in the back quarries. And, and then you can get kind of lifts served uh, off P skiing in Scotland. And, and that can just be phenomenal. And um, similarly with Glencoe, you can, uh, if there's enough snow, you can ski down to the, the bottom of the ski area. And the, the issue with sort of ski touring in, in that area normally, though, is the snow doesn't come down low enough. So you'd have to prepare for a couple of hours hike. And again, the mountains are pretty steep. So you're going to be having probably to be using sort of axe crampons and have pretty good uh, navigation and avalanche awareness skills. Uh, you can just sort of head around to Fursit and there's a, it's probably about an hour and a bit's drive to or along from Spin Bridge and um, you can go ski touring there uh, if there's the snow. Uh, again, the issues are making sure the snow is, is low enough and but not covering the roads. 
it's, it's, it's near impossible for us to say like you know to give advice on somewhere in March um, because it's it's got so much to do before the wind has been put in the snow um, so you know realistically if you're if you're thinking about coming at a certain time of year um, you need to be really set on going anywhere really I, I wouldn't I wouldn't stick to even west or east I would be thinking okay well I'm going to wait until a week before and then I'm going to decide where I'm going to go based on um, the forecasts based on previous forecasts when I say forecast I mean the Scottish Avalanche Information Service forecast, um, the Mountain Weather Information Service forecast, and then updates by Met Office, um, and speaking to people and, and um, looking at what was happening on social media as well, uh, trying to get an idea of what aspects have snow. Um, and, and then of course, you've got the safety element as well. You know, If you're gonna um, decide to come to a new area that you've not visited for ski touring, then um, you, you're gonna have to make sure your navigation is very good um, and your avalanche avoidance is very good. Um, so there's ways of managing those risks you know you can stay on sub 30 degree slopes um, and to begin with you can stay on the front side of the mountain and then once you feel comfortable with the area you can start venturing a bit further afield um, but if somebody if somebody was going to ask me about ski touring rather than um, the gully skiing or um, sort of the more steeper challenges skiing um, I would probably steer them more to Cairngorms and Dromochter because um, like Gav says just the shape of the mountains in the west make it a bit more difficult or Ben Lawrence again um, are we allowed to say Glen Roy People keep that secret, don't they? Don't go to Glen Roy. <laughs> Great, thanks, guys. I want to make a couple of questions about kit, if I can, um, and then we'll take some more questions from people who've sort of um, uh, written in. But um, do you have do you have different setups for different conditions and different terrain, or a sort of go to favourite that gets used all the time? Uh, well, it used to be a big thing uh, deciding a. Uh, for, for certainly Blair and, and myself, uh, what kit we're going to pack in? Like, are we going to take our crampons with us today? Are we going to take our axe? What kit are we going to take? And the best thing that we did was purchase uh, some nice lightweight kits so that it's in the bag and it's always there and we don't need to worry about it. So we got like the Petzl Leopard crampons, a really lightweight aluminium axe with uh, just a steel tip. It's not going to be good for ice climbing at all, but it's great for ski mountaineering. And then just like a tiny little shelter bag, and just so that all the stuff can be in the pack. So at the start of the season, the ski bag's packed, and that's it. And it doesn't really change day on day. It'll just be putting in different sandwiches <laughs> as, as we carry on. Okay. If it's about skis, um, our both of us are an 85 um, millimeter wide ski and a, a 177. Um, and I'm 5'10", that must be about a little bit, what, 5'9 or something? I don't know what you, anyway. Yeah, so um, the 85 mil wide ski, I, I, I kind of feel is like does absolutely everything. I actually used to use a 78 and that was adequate in Scotland as well. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm only 65 kilos. So in the Alps, I would use a 95 mil wide ski. I wouldn't ever go wider than that. I've skied like a 106 and stuff, but even, even all the seasons I did out in the Alps, it was so rare that I needed more than a 95. Um, I just find like the wider skis are quite clumsy. Um, when you ski steeps, you, you don't feel like you kind of roll onto the edge and it feels vague. Um, and also for skinning itself, a narrower ski skins so much better than a wide ski. Um, so, yeah, I just I love the 85. Uh, the one thing we're going too narrow is that it depends on your on your boot. You know, if your boot is wider than the ski, the boot's going to stick out. When you when you go on an angle, the boot's going to hit the snow and the ski is going to lose grip. So, you know, when you go really skinny, it doesn't really work very well. But, um, you know, I find the 85, I don't have that issue uh, on the steeper stuff. Um, skins really well, really light. Um, and, yeah, it's got a nice shape to it as well. So so we're both on backland 85s, uh, atomic backland 85s. Right. <clears throat> Thanks, Max. And do you, do you think, because um, we uh, talked about at the beginning that backcountry skiing and ski touring is becoming really popular, um, do you think it's kit? that's helping with that popularity you know and, and if so which kind of d developments have sort of caught your eye that are kind of instantly making it more comfortable or easier for people to to ski back country I, I think it's mainly to do with weight uh of the equipment you know you, yeah you could have light kit before but it was a bit of a compromise you know it didn't ski very well or it wasn't pretty fragile you know kind of ski mountaineering stuff um, like racing stuff you know but now we're getting down to those sort of weights but in a ski like I said like an 85 mil wide ski which is a ski you can ski most things um, and pin bindings that um, that feel secure uh, and then a, a boot that's as stiff as an alpine boot but you know is like a one kilo boot or a 1.3 kilo boot you know 
Um, so so that, that makes it, you know, much less physical. Uh, because what people were doing before to, to get good performance is they were going out with alpine boots, frame bindings, wide skis that are quite heavy. And that's, that's brutal, you know, that really hurts the body and you can't go very far. Um, so yeah, if you're going to spend the day actually skinning, most of the day skinning, then you don't want to compromise too much on, on the, the, the weight side of things. Um, but I think also the information as well, you know, it's easier to get the information and um, we've got better weather forecasting. Um, and, you know, the pictures that people are sharing are inspiring folk to go out. Um, so I think that's got a lot to do with it. Gav, have I missed anything? Yeah, no, I would agree. If, if, if having lighter weight kit on your feet is, is, is really important to keep your fitness level up because um, if you're dragging a load of weight up in your foot the whole time, you've got to lift your foot and uh, off the ground. So this is just like extra exercise you're doing. Re really good fitness for you, for sure. But it'll just make you tired at the end of the day and you're maybe not going to enjoy that descent. But as Blair mentioned, there is still a bit of a compromise between the weight of the kit and the performance. For sure, if you go for a really lightweight boot, you are going to lose a little bit of performance. So in terms of what you're able to ski, well, you'll have to maybe rein it in a little bit. And similarly with skis and bindings, if you're going something a bit more lightweight, you, you, you probably won't be able to ski as good as a sort of piece performance ski, but, but that, that, you, you should be putting that in <laughs> to, to your analysis. And nobody's watching anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Facebook is watching. <laughs> so, thanks, guys. Uh, I'll go take a few questions now. I mean, I, I realise that we're, we're sort of... Um, I go time, time is marching on, that's all right. So, we'll, um, so... Um, Eddie, Eddie asks, can you talk a little about how you judge conditions remotely? What temperature keeps the snow in good condition? What is a good or viable accumulation, for instance, at uh, Dramocta? Uh, so, uh, the, the main thing is you want to see what the, the snow conditions are like. So when we're up there regularly, it's quite good because even when we're not skiing a particular hill, we can look at the other, uh, another hill that we're driving past or skiing past and get a bit of an idea for the conditions. And if you can see any up-to-date photos um, or from the webcams, if there's snow on the road at Dromocter, because um, that's on one, one of the, that's the A9, so you can see that on Traffic Scotland webcams, it gives you an idea where the snow's down to. But for the, the hills in Dromopter, they're mainly heather-based, so you can get away with skiing and not too much snow, to be honest. And you've and you got to remember that it's not like, you know, it's not like when you look at a ski resort and it says, like, the number of metres of snow in the snow, you know, or how many centimetres of snow it's going to have in a resort. It, it's so localised because the, the winds are, are strong, you know, and they're, and they're, they're either... Um, uh, packing the snow onto the lee slopes or they're cross-loading all these little gullies and streams and stuff so you know from a distance something that might look quite bare but then if you know where all these little streamlines are you can quite often follow them all the way down a hill and then have a really terrific fun ski just staying on these streamlines um, unless you're gab and you fall in but most of the time you know there's enough snow to fill them in enough that you can make short turns um, and that's some of my favorite skiing in scotland actually is uh, where the conditions are a bit lean but there's been snow blown in earlier in the season and it's still there and you just kind of weave your way through from the top of a Monroe right down to Loch or back down to your route that you came up. So, yeah, sometimes it could be the Stephen. Great, thanks, guys. Um, this person doesn't give their name, but they say, I have free ride boots. If I was going to do a tour, say from Cairngorm Car Park to Ben McDewey, would you recommend a specific touring boot or would free ride boots suffice? Here you go, Gav. I think you, like having done that tour a couple of times, um, it's the, the big thing that's really tricky that is, is the navigation up in the Cairngorm Plateau is is tough. Um, but certainly, if you're looking to tour out there, you'd manage you'd manage that in any boot that you had, even an alpine boot. It wouldn't be particularly comfortable, but um, you would be fine. I, I suppose what's maybe missing from the question is which way you're going to come back and descend. If you're coming back down, say, through kind of Lurcher's Gully, a bit more of the mellow side of things, or if you were touring across to the Cairngorm Summit afterwards and coming back down through the area, then that's quite mellow. But then there's a lot of steep terrain you could choose to do as well. So if, if you were then going to go and ski down to Loch Ann, or if you're going to go and ski down into the Larry Grew, um, that may sort of change your decision if you want a little bit more performance. And again, if you're coming back into the car park, if you're going to go down through the gullies and say, Corinne Schnecta. Brilliant. The, we, we, what we do, there, there's, a, there's another picture, I think, at the end of just the three skiers, um, three people approaching the camera. There, um, yeah, it's, all, it's up at the moment. All right, okay, good. Uh, so if you look at, they're, they're actually 
um, clients that were with me the, the last day I was out uh, before lockdown in March. Um, and we were on Ben Lords again, actually me on that tarmacan. Um, and they're all in Alpine boots. Um, because what we do with uh, our introductory courses in our journey days is we have we use frame bindings. We have Fritchie frame bindings in all our skis. We've got 14 sets of atomic demo skis um, and we mounted them up with frame bindings deliberately. Now, I prefer pin bindings. Um, however, a frame binding gives us the opportunity of just letting people turn up with their own boots on, um, which is really good because the last thing I want to be out on the, I, the last thing I want is to be on the hill um, with somebody who's wearing a set of boots for the first time. Um, and it's just getting all sorts of grief from them. So people come in their alpine boots and yeah, they weigh like um, maybe could be even up to half a kilo more, you know, than, than a touring boot. Um, and they don't have the, the, the rear, um, they don't have the walk mode that a touring boot has. A walk mode will let the back boot open so you can have a longer stride and a bit more comfort. But what we do is we just get, the, get our clients to open, our, open their clips and just leave the Velcro strap done up a little bit at the top. And that gives them enough range that they can move in. Um, and then you have a day wearing your own boots. Um, we just make sure that we're not pushing the, the vertical too much, so it's not too exhausting. Uh, and the skis were, and the bindings we're using are pretty light. So I certainly wouldn't rush out and go and buy um, specific equipment if you've got a way of using what you've got already. Um, and what you could do is you could buy a frame binding and put that on a set of skis you've got. You know, you'll have to get them professionally mounted. Like, you know, Alice Brigham would um, remove the Alpine. I don't know, possibly we'd, we'd be able to move the Al remove the Alpine bindings, fill the holes in safely and re-drill for a set of touring bindings. And you just need a set of skins. So possibly if you've got equipment, all you need to get is a touring binding and a, and a skin. And of course, all your safety and navigation equipment, you know, which is something you should really be budgeting for before you think about the skis and everything. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, you don't need to go out and, and buy all the all the new kits straight away. <laughs> great, great advice, thanks. Um, there was, I think there was a question about skins. Have you just answered that, Gavin? Yeah. It, there oh, was, right, okay. <laughs> I was going to get through that one, Dax, that's all right. He was asking about uh, if there's a preference for using the sort of traditional skins that have a glue or I think he mentioned the, the vacuum skins. I wasn't sure if he was maybe mentioning these glueless type skins. Um, from from being, I, I've used the, the glue skins mainly. I've used the glueless skins as well. Um, and I tend to find the glueless skins work well the first time you put them on, but as the day goes on, uh, occasionally I've had some issues with some clients, but I, but I prefer the glue skins. What about you, Blair? Yeah, I used to really like the glueless skins, um, but I, as they aged, they seemed to age a bit quicker. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Uh, this, people maybe have more experience with them than I do. I, I used them for a few seasons um, and they were fine until they got wet. Um, so I, you just, you just really got to keep them dry. Um, I, I quite like them because you can just get them on and off really quickly. So, uh, you know, when I'm traveling on my own in Scotland, I, I want my transition to be as quick as possible because if you're out in bad weather, you don't want to be taking your skis off and all the rest of it for the transition. So what I would do is I would reach down and I would rip my, my skin off without taking my ski off and, and the glueless skins come off really easily. In fact, Gav, I've got a set now, actually. The ones I use at the moment are glueless. I'm, I'm talking rubbish. I do still use them. Um, but I, I, yeah, you just have to be really careful not to get them wet. Um, and then you can get a few, you know, if it was more than like two, three descents, uh, I, would, I would be considering having a different set of skins if I had the option or, or some way of strapping them up. You know, at the end of the day, if the glue fails, there are other options. You know, you can, you can strap them to your ski with ski traps um, or cable ties or whatever system you've got. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. There's um, just a post, not a question, but more of a statement, I think, from Mo Douglas, um, who says, the day was so amazing. I think they've been on a trip. You, you know them? Yeah. This is going um, back to the story about my best day. So Mo was one of the skiers in that picture. In the oh, OK. So yeah. the day was so amazing. Um, I've been booking with you guys each year. Many of us are. And she's um, never had the conditions since. <laughs> <laughs> but it, they say it wasn't just the last weather. Year, it was the last year. Yeah, well, we've we've obviously organised some um, a few few weekends with you guys yeah. as well. Through, and they've um, been really good, actually. Got lucky. Yeah. So, um, hoping to do more of those this this season. Fingers crossed. All coming. It'll all come good, won't it? Let's hope so. Yeah, I um, see. Uh, just in the questions, I see uh, uh, this one's for Blair. If someone's asking about using normal alpine poles or touring poles, I think you know you can use either. But if someone's asking about using poles with ASAX fittings on the end. Oh yeah. Are you <laughs> uh, we had one he can maybe tell you about it a whippet a whippet is it a whippet or is it the other one the gravel one 
Um, yeah, so, so basically what you've got is you've got, I mean, this is getting, this is something that if you're starting to look at steeper terrain, um, you'd be thinking about using possibly. Um, so basically it's a ski pole and it's got an ice axe attached from the top. It looks absolutely lethal. You know, and I used to ski with it and everyone would make fun of me saying, oh, you're going to hurt yourself with that. And I used to say, well, when I fall, I'm not going to go like this. You know, I'm going to drop a pole. But, um, you know, the whole idea with them was that you could um, self-arrest with it or more realistically, because it's not as good as an ice tax for that. More realistically, when you just have a little wobble, you could use it for support. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these things, uh, is it Andrew McLean, I think it is, who's a black diamond designer in America. You know, he's skied all these gullies and he's got a guide book. Um, he, was, he was the one who invented that, I think. I might be wrong about that. And he swears by them. He skis with two of them. Um, so, and he, and he, he, you know, he knows better than us. It must work. Um, so I used them for a few seasons. And the reason I stopped using them is I absolutely hated the way the swing when I was ski touring, I had this heavy pole and I had this light pole and it just felt awful. Um, so, I, so I've, I've now got a Shax, um, which is like a, it's like an ice axe that goes into your, um, shovel. So it's like one less thing to carry and that's nice and light and, um, it's still a decent ice axe. So I keep that in my bag and I just have normal poles now. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing, a good idea. Um, it's just like everything that's compromises the, the actual skinning part of the day. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. I think, um, I mean, we've had loads of questions and we can't, I was hoping we'd get through loads, but... but I'm sure we can, you know, folk can message us. Um, uh, like, we've, it might take well, us a bit to get through them all, but I've got no problem with writing replies. I've put um, I put British Backcountry's Instagram and Facebook um, yeah. channels up on, on there. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you guys, then that's probably a good good way to go. I mean, in terms of what you guys are up to this winter, what... Have you got any courses starting? Um, in, Loads, yeah. Yeah, when I guess when the snow comes, you guys will. Yeah, be I mean, we actually on. have we have people who you know this at this stage in the year we put stuff on the calendar and we say to our clients, look, we'll try. You know, if it's an opportunity, we'll get out there in December and we'll do something. Uh, in November, I mean, last year in November would have been amazing. Um, Gav and I was out were out skiing, um, but uh, we oh no, we did do a few days in November last year. So you know, just in case we plan all this stuff. And if it doesn't work, we either move the booking onto another date if the clients would like to do that, or we just refund it. Um, and that's just how it works in Scotland. You know, we have to be really flexible. Yeah. Um, and, and even more so this year, you know, because as well as weather um, and conditions, you've got um, travel restrictions and, and guidelines for COVID, you know. So um, it's not, for us, that side of things is not that different. Um, we have to be flexible and, and, and people coming out of us have to be flexible as well. So we have got more stuff planned for December and as soon as the snow is in the Cairngorms, I expect to be up there. Um, but, you know, we're not going to go up there unless it's good enough to run the course. Um, so we're just monitoring things and as soon as we can get up, we will. Brilliant. Yeah. I'm hoping for a good season. Uh, but then this season, in the season, we've got tons of stuff planned. So go on the website, um, www.british-backcountry dot co dot uk so british hyphen backcountry dot co dot uk and we've got all the skills courses we were talking about um ski touring courses the backcountry stuff the, the way we've we've used that on the website that's the more the steeper ski and the gully ski and etc um so hopefully something for everyone there and if you feel like there's uh you know you want to do, to just come out and try it then the ski touring courses are few if you feel like that you've been doing it for a while and you're wanting to um become a bit more independent with navigation or rope work or mountaineering skills then again we've got courses specific for that as well brilliant thanks guys um really big thank you for this evening and um thanks very much to atomic as well who um helped organize this evening it's um it's been really really fascinating and um if anyone's interested in joining us for another talk we've got a talk next tuesday um about the growth of uk free skiing grass routes to green shoots and that's with um some members of Team GB, um, the, the head coach, Pat Sharples, and um, a few of his team, that's Katie Summerhays. Um, um, so yeah, that's next Tuesday. You can sign up to that on our website. And um, yeah, please do visit Gavin and Blair's um, site as well. Just give us that again, that's... Gav's turn. Uh, british UK. Brilliant. I did, our, I did friend, our friend, our friend bought BritishBackCountry.com without the hyphen and he won't sell it to us so we have to use the hyphen so british hyphen backcountry i don't know what he's got in the other one so don't look just I'm search just, put, just search on just search british backcountry online and yeah, then it'll yeah. be. i managed to put facebook and instagram on there but completely forgot about your url so sorry about that guys no um, worries. <laughs> <laughs> but 
big big thanks to you and um yeah you can you can leave your van now blair that's um <laughs> it's just so much quieter much. than being at home i'm going to stay here there's no animals or small children so i'm going to spend, <laughs> spend the night here i think pretend that um we overran a little bit really uh, just to say i see that there's a few questions that we've not managed to answer so if anyone wants to just go on the website and just drop us an email we're, we're happy to talk away great and apologies for not getting to all those we just kind of run out of time so um but great great to chat to you guys thanks very much thanks Thank everyone you. for joining and um yeah see you see you on the hill yeah, hope so. Bye for now. All right, bye.